So thank you to all of you. There is so much to talk about here, but what I'd like to briefly get a sense from each of you is where your expertise sits in terms of a specifically Queensland context. And so, Gary, I wondered if I could start with you. You're from the Australian War Memorial, which is, of course, a national organisation. You're also a specialist on the Aboriginal contribution to the First World War. So where does the Queensland story sit in that work that you do? Is there anything particular to the Queensland experience? The um, experience of Indigenous Australians across Australia and the Queensland um, was quite different to the normal um, non-Indigenous Australian um, because of the Defence Act at the time, which meant that Indigenous Australians were not supposed to join the military, um, but they could be enrolled if they had a... Um, if it was up to the medical officer to make that decision. So Queenslanders, wherever they came from, um, were under these restrictions, though Queenslanders did get in and they got in from day one, um, 1914. Um, and also Queensland has a, um, a bit of a first because the largest amount of Indigenous soldiers in one unit is a Queensland unit for the First World War. So, you know, it's a first for Queensland. But Mark Evans, as a military person yourself, what aspects of the Queensland story resonate for you? Is it, for example, the process of enlistment or leaving or the actual work of being a soldier? Well, I think um, uh, what resonates for me as a, as a soldier uh, is that actually um, all these Queensland contributions to the Great War actually are part of our history as a soldier. Um, and uh, most of my soldiering actually was in Queensland. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are important parts of the Queensland military story uh, that actually are fundamental to some of the organisations in Queensland today. Uh, for instance, the 3rd Brigade in Townsville were the first, it was the first formation to land at Gallipoli. Um, the 1st Division in Inogra uh, was a, a fundamental organisation in uh, Gallipoli and beyond that. So uh, all of those organisations um, that still exist actually today, um, that history is part of us. You know, you can't be what you are today without understanding your history. I think you told us that yesterday. Well, and, and as I said, we're just getting a taste of each of you and we'll have an opportunity to hear more um, from, from all of you. But Anna, Anna Habeck, you're a professor of history now based in UWA and you're also a specialist in Aboriginal history, but your family comes from Queensland. Is that your filter for thinking about the First World War? And if so, what aspects of that story define it for you? <clears throat> Absolutely. I have to admit, I'm not only, well, I'm born here, but live in WA now, and I haven't really been uh, studying a lot of the history of war and the se First or Second World War. But I am a historian, and I'm really interested in how we do history. I'm um, great that we're having workshops, because for me, history is a verb. It's not some sort of quiet little noun. It's something that we do. And so it's great to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about this whole, uh, uh, some people are calling it the memorialisation frenzy that's been happening, this great interest that's coming across Australia in all of this. Getting back to my own background, my family uh, came to uh, Queensland in the 1860s and, of course, experienced uh, the First World War in various ways that we'll talk about in more detail. But uh, thinking about uh, the last couple of days being here, thinking about what happened with my family and the little, the traces, we didn't really have stories. There wasn't anything much recorded. My family didn't leave many objects, but they gave us little traces. Dad just said we were, we weren't treated very well during the, the war, our families, and so that was that. But that really made me really, really curious. That sort but of. Can you just reveal why? Where did your family come from in the 1860s? They came from uh, north of Hamburg in Germany. They came here to start up little, start a little farm. On the way out, my uh, the the mother uh, died. It was a number of at least 50 over 50 people died on their boat on the way out, and uh, a little baby was buried as well. So when uh, my family got here, they talk about my mum's side, uh, they were in a very difficult situation and had to you know recover from this grief and then start settling into this new place and worked very hard. 
and we're just part of this little community at the south of, uh, at the base of the Bunya Mountains now called McLagan. And there's a story there about an, a name change that maybe I can talk about Yes, later. and that, that will Thank come you. out too. Now, Raymond Evans, you've written not only about the home front as a place where the impact of this war was felt, but you've made an argument about dissent at home. Is that what characterises the Queensland story of World War I for you? Well, um, my work was about dissent because when I started to work on World War I, which was way back really in the, in the 1970s, I uh, originally thought I was going to write a history of um, commitment to the war front and a history that, that talked about mobilisation and, and uh, a united effort. But the more work I did in the state archives and in the newspaper collections, this issue of division and polarisation and confrontation was coming up over and over again, not just in relation to, you know, individual stories, but in relation to huge groups of the society, as Anna just intimated, you know, the treatment of the Germans here during the war and other ethnic groups, the position of the Irish, uh, the Russians, um, the, the working class position, um, the fact that during World War I, you know, we had more industrial disputation in Australia than probably any other one of the combatant nations during the war. So I was starting to see a society that was dividing over the war rather than one that was uniting around the Anzac experience. So already, I think, we've got four different ways into this event with... I mean, I think you've already, all four of you, hinted at hundreds of different stories that might be behind these sort of thematic approaches. But Gary Oakley, the Australian War Memorial's remit is about commemoration and celebration too. Given what Raymond has said about dissent and intolerance and so on, how do you reconcile that as a researcher and storyteller with the experience of Aboriginal soldiers? It's about commemoration. What we do is commemoration. Um, People tend to look at the War Memorial and see a museum. We're not a museum, we are a memorial. Our core business is where you walk through the front door and you see the pool of reflection, the eternal flame, the names on the cloisters and the unknown soldier. That is our business. And commemoration is for all of those who served within the Defence Force of Australia, and that includes Indigenous Australians. We just happen to have a very good collection and we use the collection to tell their story of commemoration. So. What we've tended to do since I became the Indigenous Liaison Officer in the last, say, five years, we've actually done more research on Indigenous, indigenous um, participation in the wars. The reason for that was Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are forgotten. They tend to be, because they were never seen, after, after the First World War, they went back to community, they went back to places where they then went back into the old status quo, the old system. So Anzac Day comes, they don't march, they disappear. So it skewed the idea of their service, which skewed the idea of how we, originally the War Memorial would see their service as well. But luckily for us at the moment now, a lot more information is coming out. So Indigenous commemoration is coming to the fore now. And through research, we've got, for the First World War, over a thousand names, 1,300 in Aboriginal men who served. Um, and I can put my hand on my heart and say at least 900 of them are definitely. The other 400, we're doing a bit of research. But this is the tip of the iceberg. You know, this, this, this thousand names has only come in the last 12 months. Can you so, tell us more about that? I mean, how do you find these people if the official regulation was that they weren't supposed to be there? Yeah, you only find if a bloke's Indigenous is if he gets kicked out. Um, because normally what happens, recruiters, what they saw when you joined up was another soldier. All they saw, I always tell people this, the Australian Defence Force was the first equal opportunity employer of Indigenous Australians. And it, and it was. And it, they reconciled with Indigenous Australians long before anybody else ever did. Um, at the outbreak of the war, if a man turned up and he's Aboriginal, all the recruiters saw was a soldier. He's a, he's a soldier. It was in the 15 days after that, he actually basically whether it was going to know whether he's going to make it in the army or not because under the Defence Act it was up to the medical officer to make that distinction. So usually the medical officer either saw another soldier 
or was racist or worked by the rules. And that's the only way you find out whether a guy is actually Aboriginal is they write on it and it's, it's, his, it's a medical complaint that he's Aboriginal and that's the reason why to kick him out. Because it said, so this is about the 1903 yeah. Defence Act. Yep. Yeah. I'll actually read, I'll read something here. Um, Robert, Robert Bond, he's not a, he's, um, he's from Meribur in Queensland and basically it states the board that assessed him described him as his pathological condition present at the time of examination as not half caste, father half caste, mother full blood, bond is very dark, it is of an Aboriginal type. His disability was listed as a question of parentage. <laughs> you know? So you can find the ones who get the knockback, but you can't find the ones who don't because when they get into the Defence Force, they become a soldier. There's colour, religion, all those things go out the window. I want the man behind me to protect my back and I don't care what colour he is. So soldiers tend to forget about that kind of stuff. But that's the problem because once they're in, you don't know who they are. There, there is a description that usually, um, that's on your attestation papers and the description will say what colour your hairs are, your eyes and your complexion. So it might say black, brown, dark complexion. But not all Indigenous Australians are, have black hair, brown eyes and dark complexions. You know, they, they, we run the whole board of light, fair skin, whatever. You know, it's up to you to, to recognise who you are. So we don't know. That's the problem. My, lists, my, my list is built on what other people, other people's research, Veterans Affairs research, lists obtained from associations, from local museums, from family members, now that we've announced it, um, that we're looking for people's names and photographs, people are now coming forward to volunteer um, their stories. So the list just grows, but it's a purely of recognition for the person who, who decides to put their name down. Um, Anna, I saw you sort of sitting up with interest at that, that whole sort of medical bodily definitions of people well, that's going, that is in, in another way, it's another part, another way to look at World War One. Is that yes, what was it is. electrifying Wasn't you? It, but I was just going to say another way to identify people that we have in Western Australia, looking through the Aborigines Department, as it was called, records um, following the war, uh, people lived under a, a legislation that was actually modelled on the Queensland legislation and was very strict and really was a, a very, a, a very onerous uh, uh, set of laws to live under and so as, of the, as in the Second World War when soldiers came back I think they expected they might be treated a bit better and so a number of them wrote in and requested exemptions from the legislation and when they did that they used as their rationale I was in France, I was in fighting here and there so but uh, unfortunately invariably the um, local police and the department uh, refused to give them the exemption because they just said well they saw this as a way for uh, that alcohol would be taken into the Aboriginal community and didn't recognise the tremendous contribution these men had made. Mark, I wondered if I could ask you about the culture of the, of the armed forces and what it means as a professional looking back at the military history of the First World War. What does it mean to the current m military? Hmm. Because, I mean, we're, we're talking in a way as a sort of general part of Australian society, but I'm, I'm wondering what it means for the actual members of the armed forces to look at the history of World War I. Well, I think uh, it's an interesting issue of culture. Um, I think uh, the armed forces has got an ANZAC culture. You hear many people, you know, you've seen the headlines uh, over the last couple of years, people talk about the ADF culture and all of these uh, mishaps that might have occurred. But um, as the head of the United States Marine Corps said, and I think it pertains to us as well, we have a very fine culture. The issue sometimes is bad behaviour. It's not the culture. The culture is sound and solid and it sort of goes back to the, the Anzac tradition, fundamental to uh, every soldier, every officer, um, is uh, those same things that were important at Gallipoli and uh, into Western, uh, the Western Front, and that was, um, you know, comradeship, uh, courage, uh, integrity, uh, mateship, comradeship, um, and sacrifice. Uh, 
And those are still fundamental today. They're being played out or were played out in Afghanistan. Some very, very brave young Australians. And they, they go back, you know, their, their foundation stone is that Anzac tradition. I know there are some parts of it. I mean, the Anzacs themselves weren't perfect. Nobody's saying they were. Uh, there was probably bad behaviours. Um, but the fundamentals of your values, uh, they're, they're what's important and trying to uh, maintain those values. You know, I think every soldier uh, would not want to let down the Anzacs. How do you understand the bad, bad behaviour though? Because one of the things that strikes me in, in looking at some of the, the details of what happened in World War I are the differences as well. The, the way that people enlisted, 15-year-olds joining up, um, people breaking rules. I mean, the whole process, there are some significant differences that I imagine as a professional you might look at in a different way to the rest of us. Um, and I wonder if that's a sort of part of the history that we don't see and that you understand. Like, how on earth did they get away with that? Or, you know, wh why did they let 16-year-olds join up? And, and go overseas, and, and those sort of difficult parts of the, the World War I military story. Mm. Um, well, of course, uh, the um, requirements now are probably far more strictly enforced than they were in those days, and I'm sure people got, got through uh, as a young person, as a, almost a child, um, because they were going with their mates. I mean, I don't know, the, the detail of uh, why and how young people got brought in. They wouldn't be allowed in today. Um, and uh, I think that's right and proper um, to do that. But, uh, because some of the, the ad hoc thing about who's let in and who's let out is, is part of, well, of Gary's story ex too. Exactly. About uh, who's following the letter of the law. But something else that, that I think is a huge shift that I know that you've written about, Raymond, is the sheer scale of the casualties, mm. that in a way it's hard for any of us. Mm. When you mm. just look at the numbers and go, five and a half thousand people were killed in three hours on that afternoon? Um, again, as a cultural shifter, as a historian, Raymond, how do you understand what that sheer scale of casualties meant to the Queensland population? Well, I mean, how can you really grasp it, you know? You've got a, a, an Australian nation here that's got um, less than five million people and it's going to um, try to absorb a casualty rate whereby about 65% of the men who enlist are going to become direct casualties from violence and then hundreds of thousands more are going, are going to become the casualties of disease and illness that are caused by the, the terrible trench conditions under which these men are, are operating. Now, you've got about 332,000 that see action at the front, but when you put the whole casualty list together and add in the disease list and the injury list, you've got 616,000 cases of casualty. You've got nearly twice the number of cases of casualties as you've got of the number of men who enlist when you involve all the injury and disease. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. And how did this nation and how did this state absorb that sort of trauma, that crisis? I mean, just mentioning Afghanistan before, and you see on the news, you know, when one soldier is killed or several soldiers perhaps are injured, it's, it's, a, it's a big media item. But just imagine an afternoon of several hours, an evening and an afternoon, where 5,533 Australians are killed and wounded in one military action that was totally futile and ridiculously planned at Fromel in July 1916. I mean, how do you deal with that as a small country? And I think this feeds into the story of grief, feeds into the story of trauma, and feeds into the story of division that I was talking about before. You know? um, and we're looking here, and this is very hard for historians to do, into the history of emotions. 
We're not looking at rational responses, we're looking at irrational responses. And as the war goes on, the irrationality grows in the home community. You know, and when the nation gets divided twice over the issue of military conscription, that irrationality is at sort of full bloom. Yeah. And we might talk about conscription a bit later. Yeah, sure. But as a historical question, Anna, that question of the impact of grief, trauma, tragedy, I mean, as, as a historian, how do you begin to dig into those histories? Oh, absolutely huge. But I have a little side door that I've been fascinated by the fact of the growth of spiritualism during and following the war, that a lot of people in their terrible grief, when I'm not sure, I can't remember the number, Raymond, of people who just were missing in action. Mm. You know, we're, we're distraught about the plane present, that we don't know where these people are, but imagine thousands of people whose bodies were never found. Well, I think about 32,000. 32,000, yeah. So in, in their terrible grief, a lot of people turned to spiritualism and, and uh, went into strange, dark corners to, uh, literally, to, to try to make contact with their loved ones. In fact, um, in, I'm not too sure about the extent in Brisbane, and that would be interesting to, in Queensland to look into, but it was very big overseas. And uh, Sir Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, he was one of the famous people doing this and trying to contact his lost son. And I know he was invited over here in the 20s to open the spiritualist church building here in Brisbane. So something there, I'm sure there were people who were doing that same, mm -hmm. seeking uh, consolation in that way as well. But given that, I mean, you mentioned Fromell, and so this is an example where there are these often quite young men uh, involved in something that is so different from their lives before, this, this extraordinary event. But Gary, you were saying that the letters home from Fromell weren't at that stage censored. We've got some in the collection at the memorial and they are probably the best descriptions of combat um, for the First World War. Um, it, I don't know whether they were just missed or, or, or that they, just, that they didn't have the manpower to actually sit down and censor them because after Fromell, most, most of the 50 officers were killed anyway. So, but we've got some really harrowing letters describing the Battle of Fromell. But later on during the war, in the First World War, you tend to get a letter home to mum and it's got, um, you know, tomorrow I'm going into battle and then gap three days later, ah, oh, and it's a wonderful day and we're all heading to go somewhere else. They miss that whole chunk. They've actually self-censored themselves. They've censored out all the bad stuff. But when you look at the 50th, you're looking at really a unit that's untried in action when it goes to Fromell. The, 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 the half, two, two of the brigades were basically made up of Gallipoli men and new recruits, and one brigade, the 8th Brigade, was made up totally of new blokes from, from Australia. So you've got a unit who really has no combat experience. It's all new to them. Um, and you can't knock them for bravery, but you can knock them for... They probably still hadn't got the nuances of being good soldiers. They, 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 they were brave, but they missed certain things that you do. Um, and, I, and I think they were just happy to survive, you know, and they had to spill it out, so they wrote these letters. Um, and they're great for us because they give us a first-hand account of what it is to be in combat. But later on, you just get nothing. It's just, you know, there was, I saw a donkey yesterday and, you know, the sun's shining and we had a few beers with our mates and, and it just they're really blasé in a sense, their letters. I think that's an interesting point that Gary raised about how actually a soldier will filter himself or herself over time. Uh, and of course what's changed is the immediacy of information. Gallipoli, we really didn't have an understanding of the full effects of the, the um, landings for days maybe. Um, now you will know within hours what happened. Um, and I think uh, uh, the letter uh, I used to write letters too, I don't write them anymore, but uh, the letters were an important way of communicating, but, the, but now you can communicate in a very different way, a quicker way, and many more people can see your letter. Um, and uh, it is an interesting point that a soldier will probably do his own censorship in time. But that's where I imagine if you do come across those collections. And again, one of the confronting things in thinking about a history of World War I 
it can be imagined as a history of travel, of loss, of grief, <coughs> of communities, of patriotism, but it is also a part of a history of killing. And it is also a part of it. So it's a history of killing as well as a history of grief. And I wonder where that sits in the story, if it's too difficult and too... I mean, a, a, an English historian a couple of years ago wrote a book that was a history of killing, um, and she also wrote a history of rape, and they're, they're terribly confronting, mm. and they're very difficult to fit into an either commemorative mm. or a, um, a sort of community story, but it is part of what changed in the world. Mm. I mean, I think it's an important mm. point that, you know, this commemoration, this four years, it's not about glorification mm. in any way, because these things were awful. I mean, the grief of a mother in 1915 cannot be any less than the grief of a mother now. Um, and but the scale, the scale yeah, um, actually the, exactly. is going to be different. Yeah, mm. Mm. yeah I, I agree. think that's important. Well, well, you know, um, in, the, in the overall figure, you've got about 37 million casualties from the war experience. Well, you know, how do you deal with that? Uh, the, 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 the sort of shadow of death that casts over the world. And then, of course, as the soldiers come home, they bring the influenza pandemic and that kills between 50 and 100 million more people. I mean, the tragedy of this event is, is just overwhelming and, and, and very, very hard to incorporate in words. And these soldiers who fought, not only do they self-censor, but they actually say there are no words to describe what we have experienced. And particularly when you've got home front audiences who are receiving a particular version of the war, which is, which is moulded by military censorship, and Australia had a double hit of censorship because it was getting the British material and then again it was censoring that, and, and then war propaganda. So the home front is seeing a different kind of war to what the man sees who actually steps out onto the war front. You know, so how do these two groups communicate with each other? completely different impressions of events. And these men who've actually seen service in the trenches trying to describe what it's like to, uh, even you know, when they return to describe what it's like, they just don't have the wordage for it. And you know, psychologically, how do they bear it? How do they live with it? Because, you know, as I said before, they're all coming back as casualties in some way or another. Even if they're not physically maimed or hurt, you know, they've been psychologically scarred. The men that left are not the men that come home again. You know, they're very damaged people. Well, let's talk a bit more about the home front then. Um, and so, Anna, can you tell us more about that experience? And I don't know whether you want to talk personally about your family or in a broader way about what happened to the people who had been in Australia and were then classified as the enemy. So what happened to the German population in Queensland in World War I? Well, a lot happened to the Germans and the Italians and other groups as well. Um, but the Germans were uh, uh, targeted by uh, programs of propaganda and demonised and were also interned and many were deported at the end of the war. And for me, my, when I was giving a lecture at Griffith and I said to my Griffith Uni when I was working here, I said to my dad, I'm talking about this topic, what should I say? And he said, straight away, he said, you must tell them we are not Huns. I said, <laughs> I said sorry, what do you mean? So of course, that led me to look at the extent of the, the sort of propaganda that was put out, culminating in some posters uh, by Norman Lindsay, our famous artist, of that I think we have copies here in the library, uh, heritage collection, which were uh, just uh, linking uh, Germans to being barbaric hordes who uh, spread, who, who were the descendants of the uh, hordes who spread across Europe and destroyed everything in their wake. And so a very hard image to, for me to link to my, uh, my well, my grand great grandpa was passed away when I grew up, but that, that, so there was that happening. At the same time, there was um, erasure of, of uh, German culture. Uh, people weren't to speak language. They weren't to write in German language. They weren't. To, the German schools were closed because they were said to be training children to be Germans and not Queenslanders. Uh, church services no longer in German. All those sorts of things. Because there but, was a German Lutheran community in Queensland. Is that yeah. right? 
yeah, which is what I, where I come from. My dad was a Lutheran pastor, so uh, you know they were they were particularly targeted in these ways. Um, and of course, it was different in different parts of Queensland, but generally it was very difficult for people. And then there were a number of laws passed so that. Uh, uh, people of different shades of German background, starting with crews of ships who happened to be in port who were Germans, through to people who were naturalised citizens and people who were actually born here were also uh, interned in camps, uh, sent uh, to Inogra, and then they were all sent uh, to Holdsworthy in Liverpool in Sydney, and then to different camps around New South Wales mainly. And uh, about 6,800, I think, were, mm. were interned uh, over the time, and then um, their conditions were, were not good, but I mean, I always felt embarrassed, I don't know, uncomfortable talking about what happened to the Germans because it wasn't good, but compared to what happened to other people in the war, it didn't seem so much. And of course, well, you know, there's a big debates going, arguments going on in Britain now about, you know, who started the war. Uh, you know, well, you know, we always think Germans started the war. It's always a bit embarrassing, but um, it, it was very difficult for families. You know, for four years, fathers sent away, mothers trying to survive behind, businesses destroyed, um, and and the people interned and then deported. So there are the well-known stories about um, Eugene uh, Hirschfeld, who was a doctor here in in Brisbane, who progressively was just destroyed and eventually deported. And when he tried to get back in the mid 20s, still was uh, very difficult for him to get back. He was the German consul here. Also. Um, uh, Carl Zola, who was a, a very successful businessman who had more or less the same experience. And uh, he, these people, was, he was sent back to Germany uh, to the terrible conditions of the 1920s in Germany and ended up in South Africa and took his own life because he just could never get back into Australia. Um, so all of these things leave a legacy. And, and for me, I'm very interested in the people that we don't know so much about, for example, the Lutheran community, because the leaders, beloved pastors, all the Lutherans loved their old pastors, and they were all, some of them were taken in, I don't know, four or seven, I'm not too sure how many in Queensland. And so what happened to people on the ground? So I know the little stories that I've been tracing in my family. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of people who, uh, and I've already been speaking to people here who have the same, a similar sort of German background who are very interested to trace those stories as well. So I'm hoping that will be, mm -hmm. and I know that's something that's going to be coming out of the next four years. So, mm -hmm. so Gary, what happened to the families of Indigenous soldiers when they were away in the war? I mean, given that Aboriginal people <coughs> were being, were under the ages of various different organisations, and then these men are then part of the Australian forces. What did that mean for their families? It actually depended um, where you came from, really. I mean, if you're in community, and it was a, a community run by whatever Indigenous organisation ran that state, um, and the states ran the Aboriginals within their states. It was not a federal government thing, it was a state government thing. So if you were in a community, the community managed you, and this is the big problem, the soldiers that went away, if he was married or he wanted to send money, because he was making good money, was to send money home to his family. The families in communities didn't get the money. And I, we've got letters, and you see it on their um, files saying, where's, where's the wages sending home? You know, we're starving and whatever. And what was happening is the money was coming to the state and uh, well, to the post office near the community and it was being held there and the Indigenous agency in the state took the money and never paid it out to the families. You know, there's, there's some real horror story stuff about this where lost wages, these guys are, you know, not citizens of their own country and they're willing to go away and die for this country and this is how we treat, treat their families. But if, again, if you're placed from, say, um, Tasmania, Tasmania, they went, oh, all Indigenous Australians don't exist in Tasmania. Untrue. So they, they, they missed the system in a sense. They got into the, um, the uh, compulsory cadet corps system. They, they got into the defence force without any problems. They didn't have those problems because they just sent their wages home. They got home. They were not restricted. So it depended on where you were what agency governed you or whether you lived in the capital city or you didn't is how how it affected your family at home. 
And so as we keep on having this conversation, Gary, would you mind using that little oh. clicker that you've got to just remind us of some of these people that we're talking about? Um, and, and we'll keep on having other conversations, but I think the more that we can be reminded of some of the stories that may not be as familiar as others, I think that's quite a, a useful thing for, for all of us. But Raymond, what Gary was just saying is a reminder of the wider political context on the home front, which is both divided state by state, of course, but it also meant there were arguments about wages, about Aboriginal rights, about um, the role for women and so on. That's your real interest in looking at the history of this war, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And what Anna was saying too, of course, I mean, Queensland had the largest German population. So, I mean, Anna said she gets a bit embarrassed about talking about it because other people suffered more, but not to underestimate what the Germans suffered, they suffered shockingly. And, um, you know, there were 14 internment concentration-like camps and uh, the, Red Clock, the Red Cross did a survey at one stage comparing the Australian <coughs> camps to the camps in which Britishers were put in Germany. And the German camps for the Britishers came out a lot better in conditions than the, than the Australian camps did. So, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the, the degree of suffering yeah, that the Germans experienced. And mention too that there were a lot of German descent, people of German descent who en enlisted in the war too and who fought overseas and died as well mm. and whose families were being persecuted back here even though they had sons yeah. over there fighting. And it wasn't just the state that was doing it. I mean, it was the general population here. I mean, workers going on strike because they've got Germans working beside them until that German gets dismissed from the job or that group of Germans gets dismissed from the job. So it was a full-scale assault on, you know, the whole of the German the, culture. That violent, the, the German club burnt down by marauding... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and in Melbourne people. too, the same yeah, thing so. that happened. I mean, mm. in Melbourne, on... on a, the night the war began, they, they first of all attacked the German club and then they went down to, uh, into the Chinese quarter and had a race ride against the Chinese. I mean, this is one of the things I'm talking about, that war does unleash these kind of passions that are very, very divisive and very negative and very destructive. And in terms, of course, of the Aboriginal commitment, um, you know, uh, Aboriginal people who sacrificed, Aboriginal men who sacrificed and then came back and found that the racism towards Aboriginal people hadn't moved one jot. And of course in Queensland Aboriginal wages of all sorts were being sequestered mm -hmm. and this was all part of it. That uh, they, don't, they don't even get the money, you know, they don't get the, the, the repatriation rights and the welfare rights and so on. So, you know, it's a pretty intense story when you start getting into the minorities and having a look at what happened to them. Uh, of course, the, the Catholics here, that, the, who were largely um, Irish, were very disaffected over the Irish, um, the Irish rebellion and the way the British very um, viciously put down that rebellion. <clears throat> and that, of course, fed into the divisions over conscription, military conscription here. And the, the Southern Europeans, there was a great deal of antagonism towards um, uh, Italians and Greeks, who are of course referred to as Dagos, and uh, there was an attempt in the later war period to round them all up and send them off to, uh, to, the, to the war front, all the eligible men. Um, there's lots of hidden stories like that, you know? And of course the treatment of the Russian community here and the way that erupted into huge scale violence at the end of the war. With the ah, red flag after riots. 1917. Yeah, with the red flag rights, but it, it, it was fermenting from the period of, of the Russian Revolution in early 1917. So any ethnic group that wasn't British, and the more they, they diverged from looking like and acting like the British, uh, the more trouble they were in. So, Mark, concentrating on dissent and divisions and difference, does that help enrich your sense of what World War I is, or does is that sort of go counter to a sort of celebration of World War I. How do you respond well, I to this? It, it, it must, it must, or Gary, you're talking about. No, sorry, I was wondering how, how Mark responds oh, Mark, to this sorry. way of looking at World War I. I guess, I guess you have to take it all as a whole. There were all of these elements to it. There was the sacrifice that people, not only at the war front, but in the home front as well, 
sorry, that is a slightly strange, I don't know why we have a piercing, it, um, a piercing sound coming from behind me. I don't know if anybody can do anything about that. It's, okay. Sorry, it's a, it's a door. Sorry, yeah, Mark, um, go on. So I think there are so many elements to, to this, uh, as Ray said. There, I mean, this, this is not uh, one thing. It's many things. And it's not cosy, is it? This no, is not. This is never going to be a cosy no, story. It, no, none of it is. But there are things that you can celebrate. There was communities pulling together. I mean, there was, uh, you know, antagonism and these things. But there were examples of people pulling together. There were examples of great courage. Uh, all of these things that can be celebrated. But I think. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't think you can glorify this. This is not something to glorify. This is something to look at as our history. All of these parts make us what we are today. And if we can learn from these things, that surely is, is what we should do. Well, and, and the other thing that I've been struck is by how much we can be surprised by these stories and learn new things. And one of the things that, Anna, I think you were hinting at was almost a sort of hierarchy of suffering, trying to decide who suffered more and whether that affects the way you do the history. Now, Mark and I were involved in a session last year where we met a, a researcher uh, doing work on the Australian soldiers who were taken prisoner by the Turks in World War I. And as well as being not such a familiar story, Australia didn't yet know how to deal with prisoners of war. And so the families of those prisoners of war suddenly had to deal with questions about the courage of these soldiers. Had they really given themselves up? Why were they taken prisoner? By World War II, we understood the story of prisoners of war and they were recognised for what had happened to them. In World War I, it was almost like we were, we were practising at a world war and unfortunately had worked out how to do it by the Second World War. I mean, I don't know about you, Mark, but I found that really revelatory. They were stories, and, a, and there were Queensland stories there, um, that were unfamiliar. Yeah, and it didn't quite fit no, with the national didn't. narrative. It didn't, and uh, I mean, it was, uh, that, that was interesting. And as you, you said, um, the guilt that people probably felt over being taken prisoner uh, and had to work through that themselves, which they did in their letters. And, uh, so again, another interesting facet of the war. And, the, and some of the heroic stories of that too involved all of, a network of women volunteers all around the world working with Red Cross and other organisations to support prisoners of war. But Gary, I wonder if I could take up something that Raymond mentioned, which was return. Because in, in a sort of historian sense, the idea of a long 19th century or a long 1920s or whatever comes in here because World War I won't necessarily be discussed as 1914 to 1918. And the return, it seems to me, is a huge part of the story. What happened to people like Reginald and others who we might see? So what happened when they returned? He's interesting, actually, because he's a POW. Um, he, was, uh -huh. he, was, he was caught in a trench. The Germans did a trench raid, um, and he disappeared out of the trench with him and, and one or two others. And they said the only thing they found was his boot. Um, apparently he'd been wounded, um, and it's men like that. He did. Where time. was he from? Uh, he's Queenslander, and his brother was also in in um, in the army as well. Um, but it's men like that. They come back home. All those who serve and come back home as soon as they get off that ship and they're removed from their military mates. They go back to being an Indigenous Australian. They go back to the same status quo. They go back to the community and they disappear. And, and people say, oh, you didn't get the same rights. Well, we did have the same rights as returned servicemen. But because these people went back in the community, nobody went and told them. Nobody went there. They didn't march on Anzac days. They didn't get seen. They became secret history. They vanish. And because they vanish, then people say, oh, they didn't serve. Therefore, no one goes looking for them. And I mean, it still happens today. You can go to indigenous communities today where there are little old ladies that don't know they can get a widow's pension because of their ex-serving husband. You know, that they get isolated and they vanish. And, and this is the whole shame of this. There are over a thousand men that we know of serving in the First World War and no one knows anything about them. 
They just, were they supported by return service leagues? No, because no one knew. The, uh, the return service league in the 1930s, um, in the, it's for Valley magazine, actually was looking for Indigenous soldiers. They, they wrote, you know, and were telling stories of Indigenous service. Um, there was a, it's not a Queensland newspaper, sorry. It's a West Australian one and it states, it says the AIF judged a man not by his colour but by his bravery, basically, um, by his deeds. So they were actually, the RSL actually was championing it in the 30s, in some places, the service of Indigenous Australians, but it just sort of died. You know, these people vanished in a community and were gone. And because we don't live as long as other people um, and at this period in time, nobody went to interview them, nobody went to talk to them, they just disappeared. And, and that just became memory then in, in their own community. But memories within communities? so it's People in community remember them. Um, you go to a place like Sherberg where, where um, they have their own war memorial. Um, they didn't get on the Mergen war memorial, so they built their own. You know, the community re remembers these people. Um, but no one else does. I think, I think what Ray raised earlier on was important, that I don't think you can go through something like that without being damaged to a degree. And I, I sort of often wonder about the people that did come back, how they actually dealt with it. You know, you go back to your farm, uh, the war's suddenly over, and you have to fit in again. And because I now, in soldiers are supported, they're, they're, uh, post-traumatic stress mm. disorder is understood. Mm. It wasn't understood. Well, and even shell shock wasn't recognised no. for a long time in World War I, was it? No, that's right. Um, and, and many British were shot because of it, by their own people. Um, so there's, there's another story. But, but for instance, Pompey Elliot, one of our famous brigadiers at that time, became a general. I mean, shot himself later on. And I wonder if the, you know, how much of that was dealt with well. I rather think we didn't deal with it well. Yeah. Mm. I wonder what's in the pages of the um, files of the Department of Repatriation that was set up to deal with, to help people, whether it was, uh, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's worked much with the, the records, but was it a very instrumental or were there lots of letters coming in from people explaining what was happening? I mean, very interesting to know what's in those files. But that's a great example of exactly the stories that the people here will know mm. and be able to develop because it's not just a story of who went and what happened but when they came back what impact on the community yeah. Yeah. both of the loss of people but of those men who yeah. came back mm. and historians like Stephen Garton have written about this the soldiers return and, uh, well I wonder if it, it wasn't that they dealt with these issues as communities and as mates that when they came back you know, uh, the pub, the drinking, that was how they dealt with it. Because there certainly are stories of violence and domestic violence as part of mm. the return and some bad behaviour by governments about soldier settlements as well. Mm. Anna, I can see you were well, about to say something there. I mean, there's women. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't mentioned them. The, the role of women during the war. Back, of course, women went to... I went overseas. I read something about... Uh, uh, nurses who trained as anaesthetists overseas and then were highly skilled. Other uh, American women who had done the same thing went back to America and were able to work as anaesthetists. Ladies, the, one, the nurses who did it from Australia came back and then became um, nurses again. So the, all of the work that women were doing during the war on the home front and, and um, also women when the men came back and how did they cope and uh, this stranger often who came back to their home. And there's and at the least children. one Brisbane woman doctor who I've read about who went and worked at the feminist run hospital in London and she couldn't do that as part of the, an Australian government commitment. She did it by, in fact, that the French supported this um, hospital in London and it was an entirely women run hospital of doctors and nurses and it was also connected to the suffragette movement. So there were all sorts of fantastic stories that you can find. But I know that very soon we, we, we do need to hear from, from you, but I wondered, and I know we haven't even touched the surface of all your individual research and expertise, so my apologies. I wonder if I could ask each of you what else you'd like to know 
where you'd like to see more research done in uncovering stories of World War I. Gary? Oh, well, this is the barrow I push. Um, <laughs> Indigenous service, I mean, it's just really starting to come out now. And I mean, I'm talking across all wars right up to the present day. Um, we've been silent partners in a sense. And I, I tell people the Anzac legend has a black face. It, it does. We've been in uniform in this country, believe it or not, since the 1860s. The earliest known Indigenous Australian in uniform was a bloke by the name of Thomas Bungaline, and he was the, in the colonial navy of Victoria. And, and, and there was another guy named Locke who was um, in the colonial defence force of, Vic, uh, of New South Wales who lied about his age in the First World War and served in France with his son. And he got found out because he was too old. They sent him back and he lied about his age again and he joined again. And they caught him again and said, you can stay. But he had family members. I mean, these, these are great stories. These are people... People ask me and say about the First World War, you got any heroes? And I go, I got a thousand of them. <laughs> because every one of those blokes who joined up beat the system. They got in. And, and an agency let them. The, the Defence Force let them in. These are the stories. I want to see more of this coming out of, out, out of community. You know, it's something to be proud of. It's, war's not a good thing, but this is a good story. So, yeah, I'll push this barrow. But these are local stories. These are the yeah. stories that the people here can ask and pursue and find out about as well. It's a social thing. It's about people, you know, and how they experience it. Mark, what would you like more of? I'd like to know more about why. Um, and, and why governments make the decisions they make. Uh, and, you know, the soldier, the sailor or the air man or woman, they're only instruments of the policy. And I, I, so a soldier will go where they're sent and do the job that the government asks them to do. But I really, if you sort of go back into that tangled web of decision making, why did we actually launch ourselves on what was to be a devastating and very important part of our history? Uh, if you look at the Hansard here on the 5th of August 1914, there's a paragraph or so uh, that says we're going to war. Well, what, what decision? Why do we make these decisions? And will we make the same kind of decisions given the same information uh, in the future? So my, my, I'd like to know more about why and how do you prevent us engaging in such things in the future? Which immediately connects us to the nation and yes. to the international story as well. Anna, what are the drawers or files or stories you'd like to see opened up? Well, I, th I think really I'm interested in legacies, and I think that fits quite nicely with the the subtitle of the um, of this whole project, which is you know uh, memories for new generation, something like that. I think uh, I'm very interested in, in legacies for across the board, of course, but it's, I'm particularly, of course, interested in the Germans because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, restrictions continued on after the into the 20s and 30s, and then of course the Second World War came and 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 uh, not the community, and then it's only recently I think that people have started to stand up again and feel like feel okay. I, I think you know it's been a long time, so I'm interested in those sorts of legacies and um, how people coped and their personal stories, their family stories. And I was thinking that, say, for myself, I can see that this coming here and thinking back again about the research I'd done based on these little traces from my dad and my mum, what happened to their families, has interested me. And then I'm thinking, well, this actually could interest in when my grandkids get a bit older, because my grandkids are Aboriginal kids, and I think they might be interested to know that their, their German poppies way back then were also told they couldn't speak their language and that they were rounded up and put into uh, camps as well. Uh, at the same time as this sort of thing was starting in WA um, with Aboriginal people. So I just thought maybe there's, there's a whole, that's just my little thing, but I'm sure that for people out there, there's a lot of linking up that people can do by looking at what happened in the war, but also at the legacies for families. Raymond, what do you think needs more work, more solid research? Mm, well, there's probably 
hundreds of things. Um, but, <laughs> but, I mean, my curiosity gets whetted about what happens to people on either side of the time they appear in the historical record, you know? Um, what becomes of them when they drop out of the historical record? And, and as Anna just said about the Germans, what happened to those 7,000 Germans that were deported in nine ships from Australia after the war back into war-torn Europe? What happened to those people, those Queenslanders that were sent away? You know, We don't know. We don't know what happened to those we people. We know some of them. Yeah, but we don't know the whole story of the huge mm. number. And it would be wonderful if somebody mm. did a, an overarching study of the lot. Um, and, and also, you know, another thing I'm very interested in is how did people develop a position on the war that was counter to the dominant narrative of the time? How did people become anti-war activists? How did they become pacifists? How did they become uh, disillusioned by the war? Um, how did they find out what was really happening, because when you look at what anti-war people were saying at the time, they were saying what we're saying now, whereas the majority of the population were more or less fooled by the propaganda and the, and the, you know, the educational training they'd had to be good, loyal citizens of the empire, where, which was always virtuous. And uh, so they didn't see through to the reality of a lot that was going on. But how did some people manage to do it? Against the, you know, against the grain of the of the of, of the dominant narrative of the society, and how were they treated in, in Rome or, or Rockhampton? Or treated, and they they too were treated rather roughly at the time. But th but they had an analysis that was correct, and and also a lot of the soldiers that went to fight and saw what was actually happening had an analysis that was correct, and we are now coming to have more of an analysis that was co that is correct than the analysis that was the dominant one at the time. Well, and that's also a reminder too that if we talk about soldiers, they didn't necessarily have a consistent or the same view on the war itself. Thank you to Professor Raymond Evans, historian, Anna Habick, historian, uh, Lieutenant General Mark Evans from Quackack and Gary Oakley from the Australian War Memorial. And thank you all for setting up this whole three-day workshop for us. Thank you.